Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fifth in the series of leadership dialogues organized by the Center for Social Justice. Um, tonight, we are tackling a very topical issue that bears relevance for all of us. The globe is seized by a raging pandemic and Africa has not been spared. And 
Tonight, we're going to hear about the COVID national response as far as vaccine rollout is concerned. Uh, we would also be able to discuss some of the myths that you probably would have heard about the vaccines. Um, and last, but by no means the least, we would listen to a friend who has gone through the infection and has lived to tell the story. My name is Soji Sojitete. I currently serve in the role as chair of the Council of the Center for Social Justice. And this evening, I'll be supported to deliver what is beginning to look like um, a production <laughs> by my colleague Stephen Kemeche and Preska Atoxia. So welcome. Um, I would start with a few housekeeping announcements. Um, because this is live, virtual platforms becoming the norm for the day, um, it would be good if you could mute yourself <clears throat> when you're not speaking so that the person who is um, speaking would be very audible and can also be heard by everybody. Um, also, we want this to be very interactive. If you've attended any of the CSJ fora before, you would know that it's very interactive. So do not hesitate to hit the chat function. If you have a comment, if you have a question, feel free to chat in throughout the entire course of the presentation. Um, and last but not the least, at the end, given that we believe in continuous quality improvement, we are going to send out a post-event survey. So any comments you have for us to improve the way in which we run our programs, if you're sending these comments, we will be most grateful and responsive to whatever you, you send through. So those will be the early announcements that I would make. Um, So just this week, the Center for Social Justice announced the few member, new members that have joined our team. And I thought that we should kick off today by really outdooring to the world, very distinguished Ghanaians, patriots in their own rights who have joined um, to be able to carry the vision further. And as some of you know, the Center for Social Justice is a platform for academics, patriots and activists who are fighting for greater social inclusion and for equity in the distribution of the wealth and privileges of the Ghanaian society. And being an overarching um, vision, we, would, we needed quite a number of accomplished individuals to support us to be able to drive this forward. I've already introduced myself, so I would just go um, ahead with the others. So um, at the top of the screen, we have Theodore Albright. Theodore Albright, is a private legal practitioner. He consults for business families um, and also provides some um, board support services. He is also providing technical support for our legal and constitutional affairs pillar. So he, he comes in with quite um, a lot to offer. Then next to him, we have Bashiratu Kamal Muslim. She's also a member of the council. And Bashiratu is a gender equality, social inclusion, and labor specialist. She also is into organizing and is essentially a development practitioner. Um, so we are very honored to have Bashira to join us. Bash is what we all call her. Next to Bashira to is Stephen Kemeche. Stephen Kemeche's role on the council is to chair the finance audit and risk committee, um, but he is coming into CSJ with uh, over 20 year background in banking. And he's recently um, started what I would think of as a, a new career um, in, in FinTech, set up his own firm, um, but he's bringing in that expertise to support us to carry this vision forward. On the next row, we have Philip Delali Zumano. Um, he, he consults in education, finance, and corporate governance. Um, he's also a man who works a lot with mathematics. So his part, he's, he considers himself a lecturer at heart. Um, he's done an extensive amount of lecturing in mathematics and statistics. Next to him is George Ferguson Lane. Um, and on the council, he chairs the governance, remuneration and nominations committee. Um, he comes into this with a lot of expertise in the nonprofit sector. Um, and he also has additional expertise in technical vocational education with special interest in social protection and communication. So that is George Ferguson Lane. And last, but by no means the least, we have 
Dr. Amanda Kofi, whom many of you may know. She's a research fellow at the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy at the University of Ghana. But on the Council of the Center for Social Justice, she chairs the policy committee. Because there's going to be a lot of policy advocacy, it's very important that at the end of the day, whether it is through research, whether it is through policy briefs, whether it is through engagement such as this, we are able to articulate it into policy um, and engage with the policymakers to be able to shape the, the direction of um, affairs in order that ultimately the end objectives of equity will be achieved. So Amanda would really be playing a key role in that. So the, the governing council will then provide strategic direction. Um, but in terms of the technical delivery, we had to appoint fellows who come in with their own um, clout, I must say, very accomplished individuals to support us in executing the vision of the Center for Social Justice. So a man that is no stranger to the media um, in Ghana is Niama Ade. He is the fellow leading the pillar on education and social transformation. He comes in with a lot of expertise in educational leadership and management. Next to him is Dr. Lord Mauko Yevuga. He is leading the pillar on governance, legal and constitutional affairs. He's currently also a senior lecturer and head of department for public management and international relations at Gempa School of Public Service and Governance. Next to Lord is Dr. Theresa Mana Blankson. Um, she's heading the pillar on finance and economy. She is currently a lecturer um, in the United States, lecturing with a vast range of expertise, which ranges from debt sustainability, gender inequality, bureaucratic corruption, and financial sector policy. So we're very happy to have Theresa on board with the team. Um, of course, I've already introduced Bashira to Kamal Muslim. She's heading the gender and social inclusion pillar. And last but not the least, my professional colleague um, and friend, Dr. William Ni Aite Menson. Dr. Menson is, is a public health physician. Um, he's also managing some COVID vaccine programs in the West Africa submit region, and he's leading the health and equity pillar. And tonight he's going to partner our colleague from the Ghana Health Service to speak to us about these very um, serious matters. And they are serious because primarily the data is showing that between December 29th and January 25th, Africa has seen a 50% increase in the number of cases um, of COVID-19. In South Africa alone, they've seen over a 200% increase. So this is very serious. And vaccines have been proposed as a way forward. And we are very privileged that apart from these distinguished fellows, we also have um, a, a senior colleague who is within the Ghana Health Service. I would introduce him much later on, but he is actually the person on authority to really address matters of COVID-19 vaccines and what the thinking of the leadership of the health sector is as far as it's concerned. So this is not just somebody expressing professional opinions, but somebody within the national control program. So we are very happy to actually also have in attendance, Dr. Amponsa Achianu, but I would introduce him a bit later on when he's about to speak. So Dr. Menson, this is really an opportunity for you to give us an overview of COVID-19 as we are seeing it. Um, and then we can dovetail into other aspects of the discussion. Take it from here, William. Thank you very much, Soji. Good evening, everyone. It's a huge privilege to be here. And um, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. It is my hope that by the time we are done, everybody would leave with a better understanding of, first of all, the COVID-19 disease, as well as issues around vaccination. And so from this point, I'll proceed to give us a quick background in the next couple of minutes about the COVID-19. And so coronavirus disease, known as COVID-19, is an illness caused by a novel coronavirus, now known as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Formerly, it was called 2019 NCOV. This was first identified amid an outbreak of respiratory illness in Wuhan city, Hubei province, China. 
It was initially reported to the World Health Organization on the last day of 2019. On January 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared this disease a global health emergency. On March 11th of the same year, it was declared a, a, a global pandemic. This is the first such designation since declaring H1N1 influenza a pandemic in 2009. Illness caused by SARS-CoV-2 was termed COVID-19 by the WHO and the acronym is de derived from Coronavirus Disease 2019. This name was chosen to avoid stigmatizing the virus's origins in terms of population, geography, or animal associations. On February 11th last year, the study group of the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses announced an official designation for this virus. And that is when it got to be known as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Now we would go straight into the signs and symptoms of this. I believe a number of us may have heard about these already, but there's a whole gamut of signs and symptoms and I'll go through these in the next few minutes. So you can have fever or chills, you can have cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throats, a runny nose, nausea or vomiting, diarrhea, some other symptoms include sputum production, malaise, respiratory, distress. And now I'll use the next minute to talk about the actual, you know, particle or the virus that causes this. So coronavirus is a family of viruses. Corona is a word that means crown. And microscopically, if you look at a cross section of it, it does look like a crown, hence the name. Um, seven of these are known to cause disease in humans. Some typically infect animals and have been known to evolve to infect human beings. So a number of, some of them include the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and the Middle East respiratory syndrome, MERS. And these are known as zoonosis they, because they jumped from animals to humans. Now, when it comes to the route of transmission, the principal mode by which people are affected is through exposure to respiratory droplets carrying infectious viruses. Additional methods include contact transmission, that's shaking hands, touching a table with four mites that someone with the condition has come into contact with, and airborne transmission of droplets that linger in the air over long distances. Now, um, there are a number of things that they tell us to do, social distancing, regular washing of hands, but then a longer lasting solution to this has got to do with vaccination. And um, there are currently three approved vaccine types for COVID-19. Um, there are mainly two types. The first is the RNA type. The second is the DNA type vaccine. The RNA type has two brands. That's the Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech. So this is how they work with the RNA. Um, they inject what's known as messenger RNA into cells and then tell the cell to produce a protein that is the same as a portion of the spike protein on the virus. And so this generates what we call the immune response. In other words, this vaccine gives instructions to your cell to make a foreign protein, which will resist NSARS-CoV-2 if you come into contact with it. And when it comes to the DNA type virus, um, it works in a similar way, except that this time it uses what we know as the DNA, um, double-stranded. And to introduce it into the cell, it uses a type of uh, virus, which was gotten from a chimpanzee known as the adenovirus. The good thing is that this adenovirus is incapable of causing disease in humans. And this is what delivers you know, the instructions to the cell. And um, I will quickly dispel one notion about this interfering with your DNA. It doesn't, because when it enters your cell, it enters the part of the cell known as the cytoplasm and not your nucleus. As a result, it's incapable of causing that DNA change in you, as some people have talked about. Now, let's quickly talk about the statistics, and then we can go into the next part of this conversation. Overall, there have been a total of 107 million cases worldwide, 
with 60 million recoveries and a whooping 2.35 million deaths attributed to COVID-19. 2.35 million deaths. Please bear that in mind as of this morning. And in Ghana, at, as at the last count, there were 73,003 cases with 65,583 recoveries. And unfortunately, 482 deaths. And um, as we go through this discussion, we would know that it's actually very likely that even more deaths and more cases of COVID-19 have existed in our system. And it sometimes gets boring when we talk about these numbers. But one thing we need to understand is that behind these numbers are real human beings. Behind these numbers are the mothers, the wives, the husbands, the friends of a lot of us. And today we are privileged to have a conversation with a patient advocate, somebody who got COVID-19, but unfortunately has recovered. She will take us through her experience and through that experience, I believe we will all leave this place having learned a thing or two. At this point, I'll hand over to my friend Soji, who will do the next round of you know, this particular event. So over to you, Soji, if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks a lot, William. That was excellent. A wonderful combination of public health, biochemistry, and um, immunology took me way back. So perhaps at this point, if we can have Helena Kemeche on, if you can switch on your video, we would appreciate it. Because as William pointed out, there is nothing like having a lived experience. We can spew out the numbers, but behind the numbers are actual people who have been infected and have been affected as well in different ways. So Helena, I mean, can you, perhaps for those that don't know you, say a little bit about yourself. Who is Helena Kemeche? Hi, um, you've mentioned my name, so I will mention it again. <laughs> um, I, I've been in the investments industry for the past 17 years, worked as a, a broker dealer, and now I manage funds. I manage pension funds and institutional funds for corporates. And um, I'm married, I have children, four of them. And I love to travel, I love to read, I like I like I love to acquire knowledge. And so well, one of the one of my passions is studying the Bible. And um that, that's that's what I love to do. So Wonderful. That's, that's that's good to know because there are a few myths supposedly originating from the Bible. So I'll get to that in a bit. <laughs> but then an investment banker now talking about COVID advocacy. How, how is that possible? How are you combining the two? Well, I, I think is, is the reaction I get when I tell people I, 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 recovered, I survived COVID. And they're like, it's as if I'm Lazarus from, who has resurrected from the dead. And so I thought it's something to talk about. It's something to uh, demystify and, and, and tell people about, tell them about our experiences, tell them to be careful because it is real. And I am not afraid of people stigmatizing me, so I can put myself out there and tell others, you know, this is real, and it's it's, it's okay to talk about it, uh, and and that's it why is. I do that. It is, and we are really grateful to have you here to share these experiences with you. I think sometimes we are just too overwhelmed by the stigma that is attached, and so people shy away instead of saying that it is possible to survive, and many people are surviving, but. What we realize in the clinics is that many of the people that we see don't actually know how they got the infection. In your case, you seem to have a fair sense of how you got infected with COVID-19. How, how did that happen, if you can tell us, and how you, you survived the symptoms and, and all of that, that would be appreciated. So um, before lockdown, I, we, I, I, did, I was on leave, so I hadn't gone out. I, I was at home most of the time and then there was lockdown and no one in my house stepped out. Everybody was indoors. So we, were, we, had, we tried, we, we tried to keep safe, but then I got a call and a family member had, was unwell and lived alone and needed someone to take care of him. At the time, nobody knew it was COVID because he, was, he had gone to the health facility and was being treated for malaria. So I went in to help and um, Again, when I was going, 
I have a, a, a sister who is who's a doctor, so he says, remember your mask, you know, the usual. But I had to go. So I I, I put I got my mask, I got what I could get and went and took care of the person and came home. A few times during the day, I I I thought that could this be COVID, but Again, um, he had been to a health facility, hadn't been told it's COVID, so we'll make the best, we'll, we'll do the best we can. But I, I, I soon got back to my life and things moved on and I didn't remember that I had been in contact with a sick person until four days later, four days later, I started feeling just out of sorts, tired, um, a lot of muscle pain and aches and I was wondering what it could be. And the, then the next day, the next day, the whole day I was in bed, I worked in bed. And by the time I was in bed for a very long time, by the time I got up, I couldn't stand and I was, I was feeling very feverish and weak. So we decided to go to the hospital because I didn't want drama. It was in the evening. I didn't want drama in the night. So I said, okay, let, let's just go to the hospital and be sure that there's nothing up. Went to the hospital, ran all sorts of tests and everything was clear. And so the doctor said, you know, I've seen this before. People come in, they look okay. Have you been into contact with someone who is sick? And then it clicked, oh yes, I, I, I was with my brother over the weekend, but he doesn't have COVID. He, well, he didn't know he had COVID. He had malaria, that's what we knew. So he said, okay, you, let me put you on this as it were mycin and all of that. And then you go take the COVID test. So when we left there, it became more apparent to me that this could be. So the next day, went to take the COVID test. And before the results came in, I sort of felt I, I had COVID because I, I got a one or two drips on my, in my nose and I said, oh, this could be it. So I was expecting, I wasn't shocked. Um, but then it, gave, it was important that I took the test to pro protect my family members, to know so that I can keep them away. And when you have younger children, I mean, you do your best, but it's, it's tough. So yes, um, I got to know, um, the, the hospital called me, told me, told me what to do, um, asked me whether I was okay. I said, yes, I was okay. And told me how to take care of myself. And um, it went on for a few days. So there's this, there's this what became almost the signature symptom loss of the sense of smell, taste. Did you experience any of these? That was my severest um, symptom, actually. And I haven't heard anybody talk about it the way it happened to me. And that was, it happened on like about the sixth day. Um, I, I was getting well, I felt better. I had finished my course and just, you know, waiting for the, the, the fatigue and everything to pass. And then I had this burning sensation in my nose and into my, my forehead. It was like my head was on fire and it was so strong and I didn't know what was happening. And so I would usually take a ginger drink and then I took the drink close to my nose. That's when I realized that I couldn't smell. And it went on for a number of hours and honestly, I, I think there's a long, uh, one of the long haulers with this loss of sense of smell because I, everything smells the same. Everything smells fresh now, months after. I, um, I haven't fully recovered from that loss of sense of smell. And this has been quite a few months. Yes, it has been, um, three, more than three months. I see. Then this would, in my own experience, be maybe the longest duration um, because in a number of people it will resolve much much earlier. Well, let me look at. It has let, improved, let me, but um, I know I had a very sharp sense of smell, so I know that um, when I, I don't smell a lot of things, I, I smell some things, but not a, a lot of things. Yeah. So let me delve into another area which has to do with what happens when somebody tests positive. In your instance, you were tested, you tested positive after a consultation in a, in a hospital. But increasingly, we are seeing people that test positive from laboratories that have no hospitals attached to them per se. And when they are asymptomatic, they don't have any symptoms or they are just 
mildly symptomatic, they go home without any clarity as to what to do. And some of the basic questions are, should I continue to breastfeed? How do I protect myself from, um, how do I protect other members of the family in the same house? So how did you navigate that conversation in terms of protecting people that you live with in the same house? So fortunately, and I know that a lot of people may not be in the situation, but fortunately I have a bit of room in my house, although I have a large, house, a, a large household. So um, I was in one place, uh, I needed my roommates to, to, to isolate. So I isolated and he had to move, move out. So we did that. I mean, by the time a few days on, he was also feeling feverish. So we, we realized that, well, it was as best as we could, we could have it. It was more difficult with the children because they don't understand that they couldn't get a hug. They could live with it for a day, two, but for a whole week, they can't give you a hug and it was difficult. So we did the best we could. Um, I had family, I had people around to take care of me. So I was most, mostly indoors. Um, but yes, it went around my house. So <laughs> I don't know how, how well we did with that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing in a very candid way. And by by your roommate, I assume you mean your beloved husband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. So there's something else that we talk about routinely, and it would be good to pressure test it from your perspective. Ideally, if you test positive, we identify your close contacts, the health system would reach out and we would trace all of those contacts. We would test them, we would isolate them. That, that is what we say in the test books. That's what we say on radio and, and what else. What was your experience in reality? Um, contact tracing, well, I because I know a few doctors, um, a friend told me somebody will get in touch with you. So I got a call. I got a call from one doctor um, I'm not sure where, which facility he was calling from, but he was definitely um, supposed to be with uh, those who do the contact tracing or those who are on the, on the COVID um, schedule. And he said, there'll be others who will call me to do the contact tracing. So he wasn't doing the contact tracing, but he was going to pass on the information. So he got me to send my information, but I'm still waiting uh, four months down the line or so. Nobody called. Um, what I did uh, was to alert all those that I had seen between the time I saw my brother and the time I got sick. So that's that's um, what happened. I had to take the responsibility to alert people and to tell them to take care of themselves and to isolate. But I didn't experience what has been um, said in, on, on radio and all of that. Anyway, we, we, we thank you for the, for the feedback. Um, so if you had to advise or if you had to share some words of encouragement from your own experiences, reflecting on them to the general public, what would that key message be? And I would also ask for any high level reflection for the health system. But for now, let's start with the general public. If you had some key message given your own experience, what would that be? Um, I thought that we, I tried to keep safe and, and yet I got it. And sometimes we wonder whether it's really necessary to try and keep safe because you don't know whether you can't see the virus, but I'll encourage, I mean, having lived through the, the disease and the aftermath, I'll encourage you to do the best you can. I mean, try and mask up, um, don't avoid the functions, the large crowds, and all the, 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 the functions that, that you know uh, spread our events. And, and be responsible, because what I, I also realize is that people get it, they know they have it, and they go to places and, and see people. That is not responsible, because there are some of us who come through it, there are some of us who may not have very severe symptoms, but just this morning, I lost a friend from COVID and he's a young man, 44. And a younger person gave it to him. And he, they know, you know, the younger person felt invincible and so was all over the place. And somebody else lost his life. So we have to be responsible. We have to be responsible. 
Thank you, thank you for that. And if you had to say something to the leadership and the management of our health systems, what would you say? Because I know there are quite a number of leaders on this platform currently listening to you. Sometimes it's really frustrating. It's, it's really frustrating um, knowing that we are smart people, we, we can do a lot and, and yet we don't get things done. So I don't like bemoaning the situation, but I, I really hope that um, the structures that have been put in place will work, follow through with people who are sick. I get, I, I, I get a call because I know, I know a few doctors um, and I, I have a, a family member who is a doctor, but otherwise it's really difficult for people who have no, nobody. So the structures, I, 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 I really hope that we can put in place a proper, I don't know about the contact tracing because I didn't experience it. Maybe some others did, but tracing, I, I really wish that the way, I don't want to sound political, but the way political parties can distribute, you know, t-shirts during election time, election time and campaign times, we can distribute masks because there are people who cannot afford it. And that simple act could save a few lives. So there's more we can do um, in the, as, with the healthcare, with the healthcare delivery. There's more we can do uh, to protect our people. Very well articulated. And also thank you for touching on some very pertinent social justice themes. Um, but vaccines, vaccines, well, when you talk about making masks freely available, it's a social justice theme, and we are very happy on our platform that you are you're articulating that. Now, vaccines have been touted as maybe the solution. It would reduce the severity of the infection. It will prevent people from getting infected. Um, how are you receiving this information? I, Is this something I, that you are looking forward to? I am. Yeah, although I've had it, I don't know for how long because I be, for how long I will be um, protected. But um, I am because the after effect, and I will consider myself very uh, blessed because I yes I, I can't smell well, but I'm I'm fine. I'm able to climb the flight of stairs I couldn't climb some months back. But not everybody will be fortunate. So. It's critical that for those who do not have it and are able to keep safe, once the vaccine is available, they should, they should take it and, and embrace it. So I will, and I will vaccinate my children and my loved ones. So I, I, I think it's something that we should all embrace. We may have fears, but I'm sure that Dr. Manson will do a good job at allaying some of the fears we have. True, true. And the, I'm going to ask my last question. You may or may not answer that, that question. Um, and this question is tied to your deep Christian beliefs. Um, you know, there are some people who are deeply steeped in the matter of um, myths and conspiracy theories. And one of them is that actually the vaccine is tantamount to the, the mark of the beast, the antichrist. What do you think about that? Hmm. And as I said, you may or may not answer it. I, I, I don't know that. So again, um, I, the reason why I like to study the Bible because uh, these things are bound to happen. And G the great thing about it is that Jesus spoke about all that will happen in the end. And people can read Matthew 24, you can read First Thessalonians. Jesus talks about what will happen at the end. Uh, there'll be rumors of war, there'll be pestilence, and this is pestilence. And his, his, his word to us Christians is that we should not be alarmed. So I would say, do not be alarmed. These things are bound to happen. For me, it tells me that the Bible is real, it's true. And so we should take it more seriously. But there are things that the Bible has talked about will happen before the end. And it says in Matthew 24 that these things will happen, but the end is not yet. So I don't think we are there yet. And this may be the beginning of the end, yes, but I don't see a vaccine as the, uh, the mark of the beast. Thank you very much. On that note, we would, 
we would let Helena um, take her rest on a very prophetic um, and biblical note. So thanks a lot. We really appreciate your time with us. And we will now move on to the next session of the program. And many people think of the next session as another highlight. I think this evening you have a menu of options. Um, it's been great listening to the overview by Dr. Nia Ite Menson. Um, Helena has been excellent in articulating her own experience. And we've come to a very important part where we are going to listen to a national officer who is very keenly involved in the planning of Ghana's COVID plan. And with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Amponsa Achiano, who is the program manager for the expanded program on immunization in the Ghana Health Service to tell us what Ghana's COVID vaccine plan is. Doc, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my vice president, <laughs> Suji ran away. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here and to share with you the national vac vaccine de development, sorry, deployment plan for COVID. I would like to share my screen so that I can take you through a few slides, which will guide Very our well. discussion as much as possible. Please go ahead, share the screen. I believe I'm sharing my screen now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so um, yes, I got this invitation very, very late, but uh, we managed to put a few slides together for to guide our discussion. Uh, it's quite a, a number of slides given the time, but I hope I can deliver that within uh, the next 20 minutes or so. Yes, yeah, so um, my name is Kwame Amponsa Um You can call me Kwame simply. And I am the program manager for the expanded program on immunization. So essentially all public immunizations are done through our office and COVID will not be an exception. Um, I'll follow an outline like this, a brief background, how we arrived at the plan, and then share with you a few highlights of the plan, and then what we have done so far within the plan, and then our next steps. Yes, um, the background has been given by SEP to reiterate the fact that uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic by WHO on the 11th of March. We also do know that the response strategy has mainly been non-pharmaceutical interventions, mainly face, face masking, physical distancing, hand washing, uh, hand sanitizing, and so in general, say hand hygiene. We will remember that many people were asking for vaccines when the first few cases happened and then especially when the pandemic was declared. And since that time, there has been global efforts in search of vaccines. You would also recall that recently, quite a number of the big players, notably UK, US, Israel, Morocco, and in Africa, of course, Morocco and Seychelles and South Africa have started some form of vaccine deployment, albeit remember that uh, South Africa has altered its uh, delivery of the AstraZeneca vaccine based on the fact that uh, there's a new finding. Let me emphasize that COVID vaccines are additional preventive measures to be already implement uh, the originally implemented uh, interventions, including those I mentioned earlier. And we in Ghana are also um, feverishly preparing 
to deploy COVID-19 vaccines because we know vaccines work. Yes, so um, what are the potential benefits? Number one is that we, um, vaccines are potentially going to contribute to the reduction in illness and death. It will also likely reduce the social, economic, and educational uh, dysfunctions that have, uh, sorry, reduce the dysfunctions in social, economic, and uh, educational issues that have occurred over the past uh, few months, almost a year that we've had this pandemic. It's also likely to enhance the mental and psychosocial well-being. Uh, people have been talking about not being able to visit family members as uh, usual as has, had been the case before the pandemic and especially coming from Helena, her children were not even able to, to hug her, which are all part of these uh, psychosocial issues. Then also we think that it is likely to smoothing the cooperation among countries, especially between us and other global community in general. And finally, there is likelihood for demand for vaccination for international travels and engagements. Because of um, positive vaccine supply, it is not likely to start now, but eventually it will, it will come just as yellow fever has been one of the, is, has mainly been one of the vaccines that are required internationally. So with the availability of vaccine candidates globally, Ghana has drafted its national vaccine deployment plan. Let me say that this uh, plan is a, a living document. And as we get information, even today or tomorrow, the plan will definitely go through an update. The comprehensive plan outlines major new components and also leverages existing systems to protect the population. It is part of the overall raw pandemic uh, control plan, and it's a product of several engagements, commitments, meetings, and reviews of available documents with several de development partners, both locally and internationally. So how was the plan developed? In fact, uh, just how we started the, the, the overall plan, we also started thinking of a possible deployment plan for vaccine because we knew that vaccines were, uh, the global community were at it, was at it developing or trying to come up with vaccines. And so uh, we have a committee known as a National Immunization Technical Advisory Committee or a group, actually the name is a National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, NITA, which essentially does um, give policy guidelines and advises the ministry on vaccines and related technologies. So they had several meetings looking at data, available data and available documents to guide, to produce a policy guide for, for, for the ministry and by extension the government. Uh, thereafter, the DG under the, the DG of the Ghana Health Service, under the instructions of the Minister of, of Health, constituted a technical working group specifically for COVID vaccines uh, and its deployment. Uh, let me state that this technical working group is purely technical, because there's also the, the task force on uh, COVID-19, which has a working group on vaccines. But that is at the presidential level. This one is at the implementation level. And from that um, technical working group, we formed six subcommittees that included co opted members for each of the committees. So the committees are essentially com a committee on communication and social mobilization. So I'll call that a subcommittee. But overall, there's a planning and coordinating committee which is within the technical working group. And essentially, I'll say that the technical working group is serving as that, uh, serving that function of um, coordination and planning. So there's also the data management subcommittee, 
monitoring and evaluations of quality, logistics and waste management of quality, research and surveillance of quality. So in fact, there's a, actually a research of quality and then surveillance of quality. Uh, we've tried to put the two together so that uh, for some of the functions, many of the functions are the same. And then we have registration and safety, which is essentially uh, based, should I say the, the basic component is from the um, FDA, Food and Grass Authority, plus adults from other agencies. And then training and service delivery subcommittee. So these subcommittees met several times and then also within the larger committee. And um, we have produced a, an initial draft zero plan. And then finally, we consolidated this plan between the 20th and 22nd of January, that was last month, during a workshop at Build One. And this involved mainly technical people from the Ghana Health Service, the Ministry of Health, and the development partners, as well as the uh, coalition of NGOs in health. So just a brief on the policy guide from NITAC. And I'll narrow, I'll specifically talk about the guide on a choice of a vaccine. So they first gave a generic consideration without recourse to any vaccine that if we were going for vaccine, then we would first of all have to look at a highly efficacious vaccine that has good safety profile as ascertained by the WHO and of course, the Ghana FDA or any um, regulatory, national regulatory authority that is well resourced to do that kind of ascertainment. That vaccine should be handled by an existing coaching infrastructure. And in Ghana, we store our, most of our vaccines at plus two to plus, plus eight degrees Celsius or centigrade. That is for both campaigns and routine. Most of our vaccines are stored at that level. And ideally, should have a single dose vaccine. That is a vaccine that will be given once, a vaccine that will be fully liquid, meaning you don't need to mix it. We have a type of vaccine that is called freeze dried, but this one fully liquid so that once you take, you can, you take. And then also preferably orally administered and formulated in 10 dose vials so that it would minimize coaching requirement. So these were very, very generic recommendations or generic guide for a choice of a vaccine. But I, let me say that at the time, there was no vaccine that met this. So what you do is to look at which vaccines came very close to this. And obviously we do not even still have many vaccines, even though we know there are several of them in the pipeline. So there's a structure of the plan. The plan that, and into a brief introduction, the regulatory preparedness and safety monitoring, because you cannot do that without regulation, you cannot give any vaccine without regulation and monitoring safety. There's also the planning and coordination component. The vaccination strategies themselves, deployment systems and modalities for deploy, deploying vac the vaccines, the immunization monitoring systems, operational research and surveillance, communication and information sharing, the supply chain processes, waste management, Last but not the least, monitoring and evaluation. So essentially, the plan looks at these components. So based on the recommendations, the generic recommendations of NITAC, we again requested NITAC to give us guidance on the choice of vaccines that were available. So based on all the considerations, these vaccines at the time, there were only three vaccines available. The AstraZeneca, which is a viral vector-based vaccine, Moderna, and the Pfizer. Let me say that these were ranked in terms of the generic recommendations that were made. But as a country, we are looking at all options. The AstraZeneca first, Moderna, because Moderna requires negative 20, and then Pfizer also requires 
ultra negative temperature. And of course, added, at, around this time, if you should get any vaccine and you have to deploy within the next two weeks, then obviously the AstraZeneca vaccine will come on top because that fits well in the coaching. Otherwise, for the others, you need to revamp the coaching system from the national to the region to the district most probably. Yes, as I mentioned, at the time, the only three was, but we, have, we now have a couple more vaccines available which are being considered. Sputnik, because Johnson & Johnson, not in the next two, three months, because we are, um, our interaction with them or interaction between them and FDA does not sh really show that they are ready in the next two months. Of course, there's also the Sinopharm and Sinovac. And I am aware that the high level policymakers are in touch with FDA to get the dossiers from these pharmaceutical or manufacturers to, to, to review and see how they will fit in our system. So, so far, I am aware that um, currently the FDA is looking at Covishield, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, a viral vector-based vaccine being, which has been manufactured by Serum Institute of India, and then also Sputnik, which is from Russia. They have presented those years to FDA and is current, they are currently undergoing review. Of course, as and when, We get more of these and the regulatory authority will do justice to those uh, dossiers as well. Yeah, so these are the, the next couple of slides. We'll talk about the highlights of our, uh, our plan. So yes, requirements for regulatory approval for COVID vaccines have been provided by the FDA. And there's also an inclusion of clear pathways to ensure safety monitoring jointly by the Ghana FDA and EPI. Of course, prior to that would be the approval in terms of uh, regulatory approval. Distribution strategies initially will be based on segmentation of the population, which I will present in one or two slides. But the vision is that ultimately the entire population will be vaccinated, of course for those that are vaccine eligible. So the initial target as we proposed within the plan is for about 17.4 million, uh, 5 million, almost 20 million persons to be vaccinated, segmented as health workers, persons with underlying conditions, security personnel, other essential service providers, persons above, 60 years, second cycle and tertiary students, teachers at all levels, specialized groups on national assignments, the executive, legislature, the judiciary, and the uh, uh, workers, the ministry, departments, and agencies, the media. And these are to receive the COVID-19 vaccines. We use several strategies depending on the target, but essentially static Static just meaning that we use existing health infrastructure, the hospitals, the clinics, depending on the vaccine, the chip centers, the, the, the other um, health facilities. Then there's also, also we are, we've considered outreach services like we do for routine and campaign vaccinations, where a team goes into the community and gets stationed or move round. Then there's also a, the camp out strategy where, which is most suitable for island communities where a, a, a team of health workers and volunteers visit the islands and stay there for a week or more until everybody on the islands are vaccinated, is, is, sorry, is vaccinated. And of course, we also use a combination of them, of these strategies, depending on the sites or the places. So vaccination will be expanded to include under 15 years. Initially, it's for, depending on the vaccine, it's either for children, uh, sorry, persons of uh, 16 years and above or 18 years and above. But as I said, we are considering all vaccines. So for 
For example, the AstraZeneca vaccine is for persons 18 years and above. But as more data become available, people under 15 years as their children would be considered as well. Of course, nobody does any clinical trials in pregnant women. But of course, depending on the data, as the data uh, turns out, pregnant women are also going to be considered. But for now, they are exempted or they are exempt until we are confident of safety in, in pregnancy. And, thus, and this will depend on availability of safety data. So these, are, I think I mentioned the strategies earlier, but um, the, the strategies are linked with the target groups on this slide. So for health workers, essentially to be the fixed or the static site, as I mentioned. For persons 60 years and above, it's a combination of fixed and outreach, temporary or mobile clinics and using mass campaign strategies. Persons with underlying medical conditions, we use a combination of fixed and outreach sites, and then also temporary or mobile clinics. And then for the other targets, also a combination of these um, strategies. And the vaccination site, the potential vaccination sites are what you see on the right. Health centers, hospitals, both public and private, outreach points, pharmacies, marketplaces, drive throughs other public places workplaces, and then also if we have specialized groups like um, we did have refugees about two, three months ago, then obviously we go to those specialized groups. And then of course, as also prisoners. So we propose two scenarios, but essentially I'll say that is a scenario two that has turned out to be working. So scenario one, and the two scenarios are actually based on vaccine availability characteristics and adequacy in quantities, and then of course human resource capacity. So for scenario one, we assumed, or we, we made an assumption that the country would have adequate vaccines with ancillary logistics and operational capacity. Of course, of course, as it turns out, it appears that because of the global pressure on vaccines, it is not likely that we're going to have this. If we did have that luxury, then obviously we do that deployment within five months. Scenario two, which is most likely our situation now, envisaged global vaccine supply over a longer period, and hence vaccine deployment will be staggered in three phases. So the phase one, I won't bore you too much because I don't, if you look at the trend now, it's not likely that we have that. So let's look at phase two, uh, sorry, uh, scenario two where we have the phase one, we considering not in any, um, I should say, defined or order of um, getting the people, but in terms of vulnerability. So you're looking at frontline health workers, frontline security persons, and then persons with underlying medical conditions, and then adults above, 60 years or 60 years and above. And initially, we proposed this day, but based on the president's vision, these days have been revised and that we're going to start at least two weeks before time. So we are working towards vaccination in March instead of April. And currently as we speak, or as I speak, our um, plan is undergoing review by a group of people. So essentially, these are in three phases. And so we'll start from March, maybe middle, most likely the middle of March up to the end of March, early April, and end somewhere in late October this year, all things being equal. But we also take cognizance of the fact that there are several areas, where if, if, I should rather say a few areas that are hospitals. And so the very first few vaccines that we have information that we're going to get as about 355,000 doses, which we're expecting in the next few, uh, couple of weeks. We have also come up with a plan to distribute these vaccines as early as possible, considering all the 
target groups that I've mentioned, each of them having a kind of quota based on vulnerability or risk assessment. So as I stated, timelines are subject to change since the country is working towards a start of vaccination exercise or program at least two weeks earlier. So we also looked at human resource requirements. And therefore, if we would want to go that life scale, we need at least 12,000, almost 12,500 vaccinators and nearly 40,000 volunteers, forming approximately 12,500 teams with around 2,000 team supervisors for the rounds. And depending on our strategy, we may need to use maybe one team for a, an extended period instead of having more, several teams for a short time. It all depends on availability of the vaccines and then of course, availability of deployment funds as early as possible. We've also considered training of vaccination teams and of course, micro planning. So micro planning is where you're actually looking at the nitty gritties of resources in terms of time, coaching, transport, fuel, those small, 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 small things that will be needed at the very peripheral level where the vaccination itself will be done. So we are looking to do that at least, at least a month, one clear, uh, clear month before that, but not at, uh, exceeding two months, uh, sorry, two weeks. So under co-chain and logistics, we know that this will pose a huge challenge, logistical challenge, because already our co-chain system is challenged. However, if we should get a vaccine that is that requires plus two to plus eight, as we have. We've also de devised a strategy, a coaching plan to deploy those vaccines. We have all our regional code rooms, except the new regions, having excess capacity. So we are confident that we can store those vaccines there, even if they arrive today or tomorrow. The national will need a bit of top up. And we've also started working on that. But we can stagger the shipment and also stagger the delivery to the regional level so that we can accommodate. But when it comes to negative code, code rooms or coaching, that one we do not have. And so discussions have been advanced to get to procure some negative code chain equipment and place them at vantage points like the teaching hospitals, the um, regional hospitals where people can walk in and take vaccines. So overall, we need new co-chain equipment for 16 districts. That is not to say that they don't have, they have, but they need, we need to beef up that capacity. And we've made proposals to that effect. And seven regional health directorates, including the six new regions, will require a work, working food room. At the moment, these regions cut vaccines from their their sister regions, original or their parent regions. So these requirements are based on characteristics of any chosen vaccine that would require storage at our current existing system, which is plus two to plus eight. And that if we need, or if we are getting vaccines that require negative or ultra negative coaching, which is um, in the pipeline, then obviously we need to completely revamp the coaching system especially at the national and regional levels. On vaccine safety, yes, safety is a priority, it's paramount. Not just because it is a campaign or going to deliver vaccines to a large number of people, but because it's also a new vaccine and a number of activities have already been planned and started with FDA, Food and Grass Authority. So we have plans to do both active and passive surveillance during and during the campaign or during the vaccine delivery and immediately after. So adverse events reporting and management will be a priority. And of course, we do know that some adverse events are man-made 
And therefore, training will focus on injection safety and would also provide adequate injection safety logistics, including safety boxes. And of course, vaccines are normally bundled, meaning they come with their devices. So they're estimated based on the, the, the vaccine doses. And of course, we add some percentage of wastage to that. So we are confident that we we'll, we'll get that. All trainings for vaccinators and volunteers will be restricted to smaller groups with a mix of virtual and in-person. In fact, for some, there's no way you can just do a virtual uh, training. For some, we need to do a practical um, hands-on and in-person training. So we'll try and follow all the preventive protocols in terms of the non-pharmaceutical protocols in order not to worsen the COVID situation. We've done that before. We've done two about four campaigns within COVID. We did oral polio vaccine, we did yellow fever. And so we have that experience. Yes, about costs. We know it will not be an easy task vaccinating nearly 20 million people. And therefore, over time, we would require nearly 51 million, 51.7, almost 52 million dollars, which translates to approximately $3 per person vaccinated in terms of um, operational cost. And this cost includes all the new coaching equipment that we have proposed to purchase over time. So this is a summary of it. We have a detailed budget as part of the plan. So coordination, communication, logistics and waste management, in fact, all the procurement issues are within the logistics and waste management. That's why the budget looks astronomically high. The training and service delivery is also quite a, um, a demanding um, uh, service. Data management, monitoring and evaluation, safety monitoring, disease surveillance, which is already ongoing. I'm, I'm talking about the disease surveillance. Of course, operational research. This operational research actually is just the, the two major things, the KBP studies and then um, as and when the vaccines are being delivered to. The Ghana House Service Research Division has proposed to do a couple, a couple of uh, studies on, on that. But essentially, outside this operational research, there are other pieces of research activities that are already ongoing, and it's not within this plan. So what have we done so far? Yeah, of course, we've come up with a plan, which has been approved by the Interagency Coordinating Committee for Immunization. In fact, the Interagency Coordinating Committee for Immunization has oversight responsibility for management of the EPI in Ghana. And it's made up of, it's actually chaired by the Minister of Health in his absence, any uh, delegated authority. All the development partners in health and then the coalition of NGOs, we have uh, some people from academia. So that has been, and it's, if I, it's a requirement, it's a requirement when you, are, you deal with Gavi or even WHO. And therefore, approval was given. We also presented this plan through the high policymakers and uh, high uh, managers to the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 response. The WHO AFO has reviewed our plans. We, they, made, they made some inputs. We've incorporated those inputs. And then we have uploaded this plan on the WHO Partners Platform, which is a requirement for COVAX application. For those of you who probably are new to, uh, sorry, for COVAX application. COVAX is only a facility that is supporting about 90, 92 countries who are eligible to benefit from um, COVID vaccines equitably, so that it's not as if only the giants take the vaccine and then leave those uh, of us in, the, in developing countries out. So this is just a facility, it's not a name of a vaccine. The deployment subcommittees are working. They've been working day and night. Sometimes they close from work after midnight, trying to adapt and finalize operational plans we have a communication strategy developed and shared with quite a number of our partners. We've completed or nearly completed a logistics plan. We've also come up with um, um, a guide for safety. Uh, we are doing the 
the final bit in terms of the app or the um, in, uh, equipment that will be required for safety monitoring. So the next steps, we need to secure, we, we have out of the 51.7 million, we have um, 7.9, nearly 8 million from World Bank. The, a couple of um, uh, donor partners or development partners have also promised the ministry and of course the presidency some amount and some commitment, which we don't, I don't have all the information on that. We will continue with our subcommittee work. Abner. And then we also would like to accelerate the phase implementation of our plans once we have the first um, shot of uh, vaccines or first uh, delivery of vaccines, which we are expecting uh, by mid, uh, late February, and then the vaccine deployment, we are hoping to start in March, but definitely not after 14 April. Yes, so this is just a snapshot showing us the, um, the vision and um, how we arrived at that. That the vision is that we get all eligible persons vaccinated. We are looking at a population of about 31 million and nobody is really sure about herd immunity, but we have some evidence that about 60 to 70 percent herd immunity uh, percent vaccination of the population is likely to induce herd immunity. Herd immunity meaning that we would we would restrict the spread of the vax, uh, the virus if we're able to capture 60 percent of our population uh, within a short time. And then, therefore, that translates to vaccinating about 20 million people. Um, these are some proposed um, vaccine delivery schedules and where they, they are coming from, in other words, the sources. So COVAX, once everything, all things are equal, COVAX is giving us vaccines to cover 20% of the population. We still can purchase some vaccines through the COVAX arrangement, but those 6.2 million doses are free. Then there's also the African medicines supplies, I think it's platform that is supporting African countries, including Ghana. So Ghana is potentially benefiting from that to the tune of about 6.4 million. Then there's M Pharma, yeah, so uh, this is still a, a proposal that I know has reached the as high as the presidential level. So they are in talk and the proposal is about 5 million doses. The Tony Blair Foundation, I know they are also in discussions with the presidency to give about uh, one, 1 million doses. And then obviously the Ghana Private Sector Fund is also giving about um, or is being used to get approximately 6 million doses. That translates to uh, around 25 million. So what do we expect in the interim? We are informed that the AU, which is operating through the AMSP, that's the African Medicine Supply Platform, is giving us 180,000 and then I think 155,000 in total, uh, 355,000 doses of the Serum Institute of India's COVID shield, which is the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine manufactured by uh, India. And this is expected, as at last week, we were informed that it will be, we should expect that in the mid to late February, but the actual date is not really something we know. Um, we also are expecting, we have a letter to the effect that the COVAX facility has given us an indicative allocation of 2.4 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Of course, these are all subject to some conditions which we have, uh, for which we've satisfied most of them. It's left with a couple of steps and then we are through, which 
we'll try and meet uh, by close of tomorrow. Yes, so uh, before I end, I have to give some acknowledgements to the technical working group for COVID vaccines and all the subcommittee. In fact, they've been working day and night. National, the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group or NITAC, they have also done a human job by reviewing the available documents and literature and data and supporting us with the policy guides. Of course, that is subject to buying from the ministry and then um, the presidency. So as I keep on reiterating, the vision is to vaccinate all people who are eligible. Our health partners, the World Bank, WHO, UNICEF, PAP, GSI, CDC, the CSOs, that the Coalition of NGOs in Health. Um, I would say that a couple of, uh, I think two nights ago, we were with our partners until midnight because we needed to submit a, a de deployment plan and beat a deadline of the midnight of uh, 9th of February. And they stayed with us throughout to come up with a refined plan and they were able to meet the deadline. So they've done a lot of work. Of course, the Honorable Minister, the Chief Director of Health, the di Director General, the Director of Public Health, the Director of Technical Coordination and all the other directors of the ministry and the Ghana Health Service. And of course, by extension, the COVID-19 task force and their coordinators who have been supporting us from behind. Ladies and gentlemen, this picture shows our working sessions in Dodua. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Kwame. That was excellent. Very comprehensively laid out um, and, and very clear. You know, and I think the comments that are coming in so far attest to the fact that a lot of people found the information useful. If my memory serves me right, I think this is the first time we are hearing from a member of the National Immunization and Technical Advisory Committee speak, you know, with the voice of officialdom to Ghana's COVID vaccine plan. And the Center for Social Justice is really grateful that we've been able to be part of the opportunity to disseminate credible information. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwame Amponsa Achiano. Um, the program manager for the EPI within the Ghana Health Service. I have a question for you though, okay. and it relates to the ranking criteria that brought out AstraZeneca's um, product to be the one that is at the top. And you know that there are recent findings that five African countries, six as a matter of fact, South Africa, Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, and Nigeria have detected or confirmed the variant. You know, that first was identified in South Africa. And there are other reports that say that the AstraZeneca vaccine is only zero to 10% effective against that variant. So given that we have some of these variants in Ghana, would you still rank the vaccine from AstraZeneca as number one? Should I answer that or you, I take a couple of them and then finally give yeah. an answer? You know, please, well, the second one has to do with um, the numbers. I was happy to hear that really you're thinking national coverage because yesterday in the vetting of the Honorable Health Minister, um, the figure that was widely reported was 350,000 for the entire population. And I think that you, you provided some clarity that it is from a particular supplier and it's not the entire figure. So perhaps you could address those two Okay. Um, your reflections on that, and then we can pick it up from there. All right. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Soji. Um, yes, the South African variant vis-a-vis -vis the AstraZeneca vaccine. Interestingly, just this afternoon, I chance upon um, a recommendation from SAGE. SAGE is a strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, which was communicated through WHO. Uh, yes, we took cognizance of that fact, not at the time of the prioritization of the vaccine, but at the time that this information came up. And the information we have, first of all, is that in Ghana, even though we have the South African variant, it's approximately one out of 10 
Therefore, there's still that huge potential for people to benefit. So it's not as if the South African one is a dominant stream. It's the ones that are um, vulnerable to or can be prevented by the AstraZeneca vaccine. But then uh, my take is that if we have to wait to revamp the whole chain system, then you are likely to even get more of the variant in here before you even get started. But as it is now, once we get the vaccine, the system is ready to, to accommodate and distribute. And so it's not as if the AstraZeneca vaccine is useless, no. It is still very useful and WHO still recommends it. Based on the fact that first the study uh, was had a very small sample size, but it's still effective against severe, severe COVID. And so there's still the benefit. Noting that Ghana does not have a South African variant as a dominant strain, even though we still think there could be some lacking around. That would be my comment. Second one is on the 355,000. Yes, I in my submission, I think I made it clear that we are looking at providing vaccines for nearly 20 million of the population. And because of global demand, these we are not likely to follow, if you remember what I presented as our first scenario. And therefore, we have staggered. This 355,000 is just a donation from the uh, African medicines uh, supplies uh, platform. So it's, it's donation, uh, AU secures on vaccines, and they are giving, and that's the share of Ghana, or the Ghana share. So it's not as if that's the vaccine we are procuring. No. Remember, I also made the point that we have an indicative allocation of 2.4 million from the COVAX out of the 6 million that we are going to benefit from the COVAX facility. So that figure of 355,000 is just the in very first, we, are, we, are, we think that that's likely to be the first batch of vaccines that we receive, but obviously that's not for the entire country. It cannot be for the entire country. Over. Thank you very much, Kwame. It seems your, your presentation has been so compelling that it's attracted more than a few um, heavyweights. So I know that we have a former health min deputy health minister, Honorable Victor Bampo on the line. We also have Dr. Nana Chumdanso from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and then I gather we also have Dr. Messi, a whom a global figure as far as immunization is concerned, um, Dr. Delano Duvlo. Um, and I'd like to call on Dr. Messi Ahun just because of her work um, from coming as a former managing director of the Gavi Country Programs and also a former manager of the Ghana EPI project, EPI program. She may have a few reflections on, on this comprehensive presentation. So Dr. Messi Ahun, please. I think uh, Dr. Ahun is... I'm Please sorry, uh -huh. I was on mute. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mposanchi, I know for that detailed uh, presentation. And I think as has been said earlier, it certainly opens the door to a lot of issues. So thank you for sharing that. Um, two things that I want to say. Um, first of all, Ghana has been an outstanding performer as far as immunization is concerned. And when I was in Gavi, um, Ghana was many stars because they will introduce a new vaccine and then have high coverage. So the reputation is there. But I think that for COVID, we cannot take anything for granted. And if there is a term that I would like all of us to use to approach this vaccination program is business unusual because of two things. First of all, the target population that we are going to manage for COVID is very different from what we have done in the past. Secondly, the negative stories that we have had first of all about COVID disease itself, and then the vaccine 
uh, presents a different type of challenge. And we are glad that Ghana is doing KBP studies and other studies which we will use because the, the communication has to be based on data. So we know that Ghana is an excellent performer, but as we get ready to face this challenge, I think all of us, and it's not just health workers, I'm glad that this is social justice looking at this issue, that all of us need to come together to approach this as a business unusual uh, strategy so that we'll be able to actually address this issue. So for example, things like looking at people with comor uh, comorbidities or pre-existing morbidities, we haven't had to look at it that way in terms of immunization programs. I have no doubt that Kwame and his team will uh, pull together all the resources that is needed to address this issue and I think that all of us need to be participants to support the um, immunization program to make sure that we are able to address this and then break, uh, put a pause to this pandemic, which has affected us all. So thank you again, uh, Kwame, and thank you uh, for the group which put together this group. And I think that Kwame, there's so much, people are crying for information. So it's very important that um, your team pans out to the various radio stations and give information because people want to know. Somebody was asking me that the news file um, presentation was confusing because it was saying the aged are not included and uh, people are not aware that you have developed such a detailed plan. So that plan, needs to be shared so that people will know that we are on top of this. Thank you very much. Okay, so Thank you very much, Dr. Messi Ahun. And hopefully the platform provided by the Center for Social Justice would help to provide greater clarity. Um, I have a couple of questions and then we transition to the final segment. Okay. This is from Mr. Moy. And he's, his question to you, Kwame, yeah. is, his question to you is, why will Ghana choose a vaccine that is 76% effective? A single dose should not override effectiveness. So that is from Mr. Moy. And the last question I have here is from Ralph Tete Amlalo. And he's asking whether Ghana is actively performing genome sequencing to identify new variants within its population. Ralph Tete Amlalo wants to know whether Ghana is actively performing genome sequencing to identify new variants within its population. Over to you, Kwame. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, my former boss, Dr. Messi Ahun. Um, I pay respect to you for the support you give us behind the scenes. Now I'm bringing it in front of the scenes. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much. And we've taken your comments and your advice in good faith. The communications, the communication issues have come up and um, we've had a challenge uh, in the sense that the people who are doing the communication actually are not the ones who are behind the wheel. So they probably are filling the void which we have indirectly created but not through any fault of ours. So thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so uh, let me start from the easiest one, actively performing genomic sequencing. Yes, the ministry has engaged the um, Noguchi, Memorial Institute for Medical Research. And that is how come I'm able to tell that for the variants that we have, it's about what the South African is one is about one in 10. So we are actively doing that. And that would continuously be done to shape and of course reinform decision making. Now it's still about the efficacy and um, the, I, the second part was not very clear, but it was about a uh, single dose should not override effectiveness. So it's a I think the point he was making was that um, AstraZeneca is the vaccine is seventy six percent effective. Um, you are looking at a single dose as one of your selection criteria, but he doesn't okay. think that. Okay. 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 So right. first of all, AstraZeneca is not a single dose vaccine. 
So you still need to. I think I may probably. I wasn't. I wasn't put right, but it is the Johnson and Johnson that is potentially going to be delivered as a single dose. But as I said, the the manufacturer is not ready yet, and even in the next two three months, it's, it's likely that we may not have uh, had any um, justification to start that. But of course, the efficacy of a vaccine is not the only determinant of the use of, of the vaccine. You need to consider everything else, including the delivery. But first, let me say that we are not only looking at the AstraZeneca vaccine. As I said, it is open. So we are looking at AstraZeneca, we are looking at Moderna, we are looking at uh, Pfizer. But in the interim, we do not have equipment to, let's say, to take Pfizer on board in the next two, three weeks. And therefore, any vaccine which has good efficacy and has good safety profile and fits in our system, we can be delivered in the next couple of weeks to say, for, let's say four weeks to the next six weeks. I mean, you will not stand by for people to die because first you want to get a vaccine that has 95 efficacy. So you want to start a vampire or cold chain system, which may take about six months before you do that. So we'll do, be doing that side by, side by side. So it is not as if we are oblivious of that fact, but we still need to start and start with a good, a good vaccine, which has been approved and which has been recommended, or which has a good safety and efficacy profile. Thank you so much. I know your, your presentation was very comprehensive and you do need to catch your breath. Um, there, there are a lot of comments coming in in the chat function, a number of questions as well. So hopefully we would have some additional time to take a second round of questions. But for now, I'd like to transition to William, Dr. William Ni Aite Menson, the CSJ fellow in charge of health and equity. He's compiled some myths about vaccines that he would want to address. And I think he hit off with the matter of the DNA. So perhaps he would want to tell us, are vaccines a grand plan to depopulate Africa? Over to you, William. Thank you so much. Brilliant question, Soji. So there's zero truth in that, and I'll tell you why. Um, you would have to look at the folks who are being vaccinated now, right? The countries that have the relatively huge supply of these vaccines and are giving these same vaccines to their populations. And so if these specific vaccinations lead to depopulation, then they will be depopulating themselves first. That's the thing. Secondly, um, when it comes to this particular disease, it's true that we are still learning about it. But then, like I said earlier, you know, our best bet to control this will be still the vaccines. And so there's zero truth. And then none of the people are advocating for these have actually been giving these same vaccines on TV and public. And so it's, it's, it's not the most most logical thing to say as um, a plan to depopulate Africa. It's patently false. So, Ji, can you share your screen, please, with the myths bit? I'm unable to see it on my computer. Okay, got it. And please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, I can. Beautiful. So I, um, I would, I yeah, yeah, I would like to thank Dr. Kwame Amponsanchiano for that brilliant elucidation of Ghana's plans to, you know, get the vaccines to our people when we need it the most. Um, this has been very revealing. And I've personally learned a lot about the path to getting us that much needed herd immunity. For this segment of our discussion, I will quickly go through a number of myths that are being propagated everywhere, not just by fringe elements, but unfortunately by even some mainstream sources. And so it is my hope that by the end of this presentation, all of us will be equipped to, be, to become champions of 
correct information and fighters against deliberate disinformation. Okay, so um, this is what the coronavirus looks like under the microscope. And to picture it conceptually, what you are seeing here is a thousand or one over 10,000, not a thousand of the full stop that you have at the end of whatever sentence you might be reading now. So um, I will quickly go through some of these so that we can take questions. So the first myth that we got from the folks who contacted us is that the virus is just a mutated form of the common cold. This is false. I can't move my screen, excuse me. Good. So the truth is that, and again, I alluded to this in the introduction. It is not. And the coronavirus indeed is a large family of viruses. And even though SARS-CoV-2 shares similarities with other coronaviruses, four of which might cause the common cold. And these ones also look, might look similar under the microscope. The specific virus that's causing this disease is very different from those which cause the common cold. So the second myth is that this virus was made in a lab. The truth is um, there's currently no concrete evidence suggesting that this virus is man-made. Um, from the studies that have been done, SARS-CoV-2 closely resembles two other coronaviruses that have triggered outbreaks in recent decades, right? We have the SARS and then we have the Middle East Respiratory Virus, the MERS. So all these three seem to have originated in bats. And like I mentioned, conditions that start in animals and jump onto human beings known as zoonosis. This happens to be one of them. And um, this therefore falls in line with these naturally occurring viruses. The third myth that I would like us to dispel is that if you have coronavirus, you will know. Um, I didn't plan to do this, but I would have to disclose to all of us that I am a, I am a COVID-19 survivor. Um, somewhere in November, I needed to travel outside of Ghana for work, which is why I, I had to go for this test. I was, I was totally asymptomatic. So I went, got the result, and they said I was positive. Um, I therefore just went to my house, you know, and like Helena did, decided to isolate from my wife and my daughter. Two weeks later, I went for the test and I had become negative. Um, fortunately for me, I would not have known that I had COVID-19 if I didn't have those travel plans. And so I am a testimony to the fact that the sentence you see here indeed is a real myth. Um, and COVID-19 causes a wide range of symptoms, most of which I mentioned earlier. And some of these symptoms are also found in other respiratory conditions. And even malaria, and even some of them might be seen when you know folks get malaria. And so the only way one can really confirm that they have this condition is after a laboratory test. So the next myth is that vitamin C supplements will stop one from catching COVID-19. Um, we do not yet know that this can render people immune. In fact, vitamin C in the past has not even been very successful, even though it might shorten the duration if one catches one. But it's still a good thing to take, but then it does not stop you from catching COVID-19. And then another group of people might tell you that antibacterial soap will not be helpful against COVID-19 because it is um, a virus. And um, like Dr. Achiano mentioned, um, hand hygiene has been one of the pillars that we have used you know, in our response against COVID-19. And you know, one thing that we know from basic chemistry is that the combination of soapy water and vigorous rubbing has the potential to disassemble the virus building blocks and then dissolve the sticky parts that causes it to adhere to human skin. Hand sanitizers with 60% or more of alcohol content work in a similar way. 
But then hand sanitizers are nowhere near as reliable as soap and water. And so I remember in some of those campaigns, we just say that you will use hand sanitizer if there's no running water and soap available. Let's take note, please. And then there's another myth that one can self-treat by taking chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Um, these two have been mentioned. These two are still undergoing all kinds of tests. Um, but one thing that we need to bear in mind is that it's dangerous. In fact, it's a lethal poison if not used correctly, you know, under the recommendations of a qualified physician. And like I mentioned earlier, we are still learning about these. But as of now, there's no information that you can self-treat by taking chloroquine. The next myth is that we can't trust COVID-19 vaccines because they were rushed. Um, so first of all, I won't mention what happened you know, as a rushed process. The vaccines that have been, that, that are out there that folks have started using have been proven to be safe and effective. And this was developed in record time for a number of reasons. The first is that it's leveraged you know, recent technology in the development of previous you know, vaccines that had not yet been deployed. And so we had like a building block and we had the ideas in mind to build this. Secondly, there was a quick mobilization of funds to continue you know, this process of learning more about how these vaccines work. Thirdly, there was a large pool of people Hello. who were ready to be tested. Hello. There were a large pool of people who were ready to be tested for, you know, with the developed vaccines. And so I can assure you that these vaccines have undergone the same rigorous processes as every other vaccines. No steps were, were skipped. Instead, we can thank the unprecedented global collaboration and investment, like I mentioned, for this shorter time frame. So the next, the next uh, myth is that we don't know what's in this, these vaccines. So manufacturers are obligated to publish the ingredients that they have in these vaccines. So apart from the active ingredients, we also have what's known as the adjuvants. And these are the things that keep the vaccine over a longer period and also facilitate its delivery into the cells as and when needed. And so both vac the vaccines that exist contain fats that help deliver the mRNA into your cells and some you know, other ingredients that maintain its stability, like I said. And I would have to mention this, that the COVID-19 vaccine does not contain microchips or any form of tracking device. This is just anti-vax propaganda, which we must, you know, ignore with all the strength that we have. So um, we are coming to the end. Another person is saying, I already had COVID-19, so I won't benefit from the vaccine. Um, this cannot be entirely true because um, a few people have been seen to get the infection more than once. And if one infection protects you, this would not be so. But then, like I said, we keep learning about this. And so to enhance your own protection, it will be imperative to take these vaccines when they become available where you are so that you have all the protection that you need. So another person is saying that since COVID-19 survival rate is so high, they might not need a vaccine. Um, this is not true. Um, the fact is that um, even though most people who get COVID-19 are able to recover, a lot of people also develop severe complications. So far, actually the number is bigger than what we have here. More than 2 million people around the world have died from COVID-19. And that doesn't account for people who survived and needed to be hospitalized. COVID-19 in some people has had a long tail. So there are even people who may have recovered still seem to have some respiratory symptoms 
a number of months after that, you know, so-called recovery. So another myth that I'd like us to dispel is that once I get the vaccine, I won't have to wear a mask or worry about social distancing. So even if you get the vaccine, you should continue to practice the precautions that we continue to preach. And um, there are a number of reasons. The first is that that immune response that protects you doesn't come up immediately you get the injection. In some cases, it might take a few days. And so within that period, you are still susceptible. In addition, the vaccines that are available are not single dose vaccines. And it is so for a reason that um, for one of them, I don't quite recall the name, the very first dose gives you about 60 something percent protection. And then after 21 or 28 days, when you take the second dose, your protection is enhanced to between 94 and 95 percent. And so these are the reasons why you should continue to protect yourself even after getting the vaccine. And then another group of people would say that they are not at risk for severe complications and so they do not need the vaccines. Um, a lot of people who unfortunately have passed on from COVID-19, a lot of people whose livelihoods have been destroyed, a lot of people who are suffering significant morbidity are young without any comorbidities. And yet this vaccine is, and yet I beg your pardon, this virus is able to wreak all of that havoc. Um, and unfortunately, it's not just about you. When you get it, you can also give it to your loved ones, which I don't think anybody here wants to do. And so this vaccine has really been developed to protect you and family, regardless of what age or graphic group you fall into. And so these are a number of the you know, myths that are friended with us. And I hope that we've done a good work to dispel these. So over to you, I think we'll be doing a Q&A bit next. Thanks a lot, um, William, that was, that was awesome. Um, and I know that we have Honorable Dr. Victor Bampo, a former Deputy Minister of Health, who has a question for, I think, Kwame. So Honorable, please shoot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Soji, Soji Tete. This is, has been fantastic. I've learned a lot, as have other people, I'm sure. And also thank you to uh, Dr. Amponsa Achiano and also to my own good friend, William, for these pearls of wisdom. I just wanted to make a quick comment following on from what Dr. Messi Ehun said. And I think that learning from, and I worked with Kwame uh, Amponsa Achiano on, on Ebola a few years ago. And Kwame, you remember the issues we had when we tried to do the Ebola um, vaccine clinical trials here. So Very my well, only, uh, yes, my only admonition is that you let the risk communication go ahead of it. I mean, William has mentioned so many myths. There are people who you would expect would not have some of these thoughts, but you know, it's pervasive in our society. So just an area that we must watch and make sure that the information goes ahead of the vaccine maybe many weeks um, in advance. Thank you, over. Thank you very much for that. The Business and Financial Times is also leading with the headline asking about what support the local pharmaceutical industry will get um, to produce COVID-19 vaccines locally. So Kwame, your reflections on that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me thank my former boss for the submission. Yes, we, I, I worked with the Honorable uh, for quite some time on Ebola. And that backlash is still lingering around because uh, that is the reason nobody actually even wanted to do COVID vaccine uh, trials in Ghana because they thought that they could suffer the, the same fate that uh, the Ebola group suffered. And that is not good for, for, for the country at all. Thank you, Honorable. Yes, um, I, I do know that the, His Excellency the President is, has constituted a team to look into vaccine manufacture. But you know, that takes a lot of, it's a huge investment and it is not likely we'll do, we can produce vaccines in the next two years. It's going to be a lot of work. 
But of course, the local industry will benefit a lot. And I know that plans have started, the discussions have started, but definitely, I, I, I don't know what, what exactly it takes, but I know it takes a lot. So those are my reflections. Thank, Thank you. you. Josephine Pongo wants to know what support is being put in place for the Food and Drugs Authority to be able to conduct checks as part of the vaccine rollout. Oh, OK. Yeah, so I, I before I joined you, I was actually at the FDA. <laughs> We've been working with FDA closely for um, I think since 2001 on vaccine safety. So I'm virtually part, part of FDA. I used to be the link person between the uh, Ghana Health Service EPI and FDA until recently when I was appointed the EPI manager. But I'm still living, uh, working with them. So if I'd have been part of their plan from the onset. So if you remember, I told you a section was, a section of the plan was on the regulation and um, safety monitoring. Uh, so essentially the budget component for that was actually uh, drafted by FDA and incorporated and we all work together. So whichever support we have, we will get uh, the fair share of that because vaccine safety is, is paramount, not just for COVID, but also for even the routine vaccines that we, so we support each, each other quite well in that sense. Over. Thank you very much for your answer. Abigail has concerns about the effectiveness against emerging variants. So she says, may I know what pertains to the UK variant, which is surging in the country now? Can the vaccine still be used to control it? Yes. Um, as I said, I will share, a, uh, I have a, a WHO recommendation which talks about these new variants and the recommendation thereof for AstraZeneca vaccine in particular. And I think that would be helpful, but essentially it is still recommended because it is effective against uh, most of the UK variants. It's not just one variant, but there, I think there are a couple of them. And it's still very effective against that. Not just for a severe disease, but even for moderately severe disease. Okay. Last question, because I know we are we are virtually out of time. The $15 million you quoted, Abigail wants to know whether that amount is for the entire vaccination program up until October for the entire population. Oh, okay. I think, uh, Abigail probably misquoted. I think it was 51.7, nearly 52. And that is for the, the, is targeting the 20 million. And if you have to go beyond 20 million people, then obviously we need some top up, but this is still a budget and therefore it could be a little lower or even a little more, but it takes care of the entire program aiming at the 20 million pop, uh, population or persons. Okay. Mr. Samuel Zan Akolgo is latching onto a statement issued by the Vatican and is calling for all hands to be on deck as called out by Dr. Ahun. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to express gratitude to our esteemed speakers. I think this has been very rich, um, but there's a colleague on the CSG platform who will do a much better job of it. Steven Kameche, please, over to you. Can you close us? Sorry about that, I was muted. I'm sure you like you all agree that this has been very educative. Um, the presentations have helped a lot to give us understanding. And my job here is to express our gratitude, the gratitude of the center to all of us, first and foremost, for attending, uh, to Dr. Amposa Achiano for such uh, I, a, a great presentation providing information that as you mentioned earlier until now uh, was not available to us and uh, if I could just be a bit controversial um, if you don't have the podium to speak to the population I mean to the masses about this plan then get on the road yourself and, uh, and start speaking uh, it's been suggested that 
the, the media, the radio stations, the TV stations are willing to give platform for information that you know is contained in your presentation. And I think the sooner we start putting the information out, um, uh, the better it will be for the population. And it will help the work, you know, and the immunization, actual immunization when the time comes. So we are most grateful. We are, we are grateful for all the speakers. I've seen a couple of senior uh, health sector uh, persons on the call. We are grateful for everybody, for all of us who have said, you have logged on. Uh, we are grateful for, for joining us this afternoon for this discussion. I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, in previous leadership dialogue series, we've basically repeated the announcement that we were calling for experts into all our thematic areas to help us or to help the center um, run and address the various issues that we are focusing on. And uh, the response has been phenomenal. We've gotten a lot of people that have come through. Suji so had mentioned in his earlier presentation a lot of the appointments that we have since made um, to various positions of the center. But we are still open, we are calling for membership. Um, so I just want to go through some benefits for members uh, who may join. As a member of CSJ, you will receive regular updates, bulletins on uh, research papers, um, on uh, discussions such as this, um, information that either to is not available in all the thematic areas that we are looking at. Um, you'll be invited to our programs. The Leadership Dialogue Series is one of such programs. You also have a series of uh, research presentations throughout the year, and uh, you'll be invited to all of them. Um, if need be, you'll be assisted and supported with scholarships as we, we organize them to go into studies, um, and as the opportunities come for funding, um, uh, it will be extended to you. The idea is to, is to train people within the center to become a technical expert and to become fellows in order to help us do the work. And then of course, um, you'll be supported in, in, in uh, professional development around the various topics that we uh, are focusing on. Now, um, a question was, you know, in the uh, chat about the availability of the information or the video for this program. As we've always done with all our leadership dialogue series, the video will be available on our website. Uh, so it can be assessed at any time by anybody for reference purposes and then for information purposes. Talking about our website, we are also fully online. Um, our website, uh, our website, cjkana.com. Um, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on uh, YouTube. Um, and then, so you can actually get to us, uh, just type in CLJ Ghana. You'll be able to locate us and you can send us information. So with that, um, We've come to the end of the program. And once again, we want to say thank you for everyone who has logged in. Be on the lookout. Um, definitely, um, the Leadership Dialogue Series is a series of discussions such as this, you know, touching on various areas of our thematic uh, uh, focus areas. And you'll be invited again. So when we invite you, um, join us and let, let's discuss together. We've, Last but not the least, I also want to thank the media. We've invited quite a number of media persons and organizations to cover this session and this discussion. We are grateful. I've seen a couple of them. We are grateful that you joined and we work with you to um, put this information out there. Thank you once again. Thank you everyone for, for, for joining. Have a great evening. Yes, happy to have been here. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.
。拜拜。Yeah.